Hello everyone. Welcome to Active and Effective Supervision Training. My name is Jill Rojas. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources and I will be narrating your presentation today. Today we will be going over Active and Effective Supervision, the reasons for Active and Effective Supervision, and what happens when we're not doing it properly. So how many of you have ever had students tell you hey, you're not my parent, you can't tell me what to do before school, after school, or when they're in the street or the sidewalk. Well, guess what? You can tell them. Education Code 44807 is actually the code that allows you to do that. It says that every teacher in a public school shall hold pupils accountable to, for their strict conduct on the way to and from school. So the next time a student tells you you're not their parent and you can't tell them what to do, you can tell them that you have Education 44807 behind you. So raise your hand if you've ever heard the term in loco parentis. It doesn't mean the crazy parent, even though that's kind of what it seems like. It really means in place of the parent or instead of the parent. And it refers to your legal responsibility over students. So however a parent would behave with their student is how you would behave when they are not with their child because you are with their child at school all day. Daly versus Los Angeles Unified School District is a very old lawsuit, but I bring it up because it's still pertinent today. So this is a lawsuit from 1970 where a student was actually killed when he and another student were slap fighting in the school gym. The physical education teacher was actually present, but he was in his office eating lunch, and it was probably during lunchtime that the boys were in the gym. The problem with this particular lawsuit is that the teacher knew the boys were there and where they weren't supposed to be, but because he was having his lunch in his office, he didn't come out. The two boys were slap fighting, one of them fell backwards, hit his head, and then later died. So would the teacher and the school district be liable for this particular type of lawsuit? Well, this went to the California Supreme Court and it they say that either a total lack of supervision or the ineffective supervision would constitute a lack of ordinary care. Therefore, not only would the teacher be held responsible, but the school district was definitely held responsible and liable for the death of the student. <clears throat> so we all have a duty for supervision that extends to when a student is off campus. So in Hoyam versus Manhattan Beach City School, a 10 year old boy decided during summer school that he'd had enough of class and he took off. Well, what happened to him is about four blocks from the school, he was hit by a motorcycle. And so what would be the care and the duty that needed to be offered to this student? So this particular, in this particular case, the, something had to be done. Now, would you run out of your classroom and chase the 10-year-old that left campus? Well, no, because then you would leave the rest of your students unsupervised. But you should have a plan at each of your school sites of what to do. Generally, you would call the office and you would report the name of the student, what they were wearing, and the general direction that they left in, and somebody else who was not in charge of supervising students at the time would then find the student, even if it meant following them off campus to keep them safe. Look right there. How many of you have heard of the California Code of Regulations? Probably not many. Most of you have heard of the Ed Code, but this is another code that governs education. Title V is actually the section of the CCNR that is about education. This particular one, which is 5531, talks about the supervision of extracurricular activities of pupils. And what it means is that anytime we have a district or school-sponsored event, students have to be supervised by the staff of the school or school district. They are under the direct supervision of a certificated employee or someone from the district or the superintendent's office. <clears throat> so this is another California Code of Regulation, Title V, 5591, which is the supervision of athletic team activities. And although some of the schools, you don't have the athletic teams like our middle schools and high schools do, you still should know about this particular code. So this talks about that 
whenever we hold uh, team events, whether it's a class or organization or anything that has to do with sports, then we need to make sure that the students are supervised. If it's non-certificated mm -hmm. coaches, they really have no authority other than to supervise students during the actual team event or practices. <clears throat> Another California Code of Regulation under Title V is 5596, which is the Code of Ethical Conduct. And this has to do with, again, the athletic programs. It applies to the students and the coaches as well. It talks about showing respect for everyone, including the players. It talks about integrity and the judgment of game officials and proper conduct and fair play. So here is the board policy 4327 that talks about temporary athletic team coaches. So I prefer that we hire our own people, first certificated teachers to do the coaching because they have more to lose. They, you have a credential, you have your job. I also, if we can't get a certificated person, then I would also recommend a classified employee because again, you have something to lose if you don't do the right thing. But when we have our temporary athletic coaches that are walk-ons, which means they are not employees of ours, they really don't have anything to lose except for the stipend that they receive for doing the coaching. So this particular board policy just talks about that a certificated person should be offered the coaching position first. And it just talks about that everyone has the appropriate level of competence, knowledge, and skill. Again, supervision is of the utmost importance and students should be supervised properly at all times. Government Code 815.2 talks about how a public entity can be liable for an injury that's caused either by an act or by the lack of action of an employee within the scope of his or her employment. So basically what it means is that as long as you act within the scope of your employment, that you'll be okay. But know that if you do something outside the scope of your employment, the district will not cover you for liability. They will not get you an attorney to represent you if you are sued, and they will not cover any of your legal expenses. So you must act only within the scope of your employment, which means if you were hired to teach, then you teach students. You make your best uh, estimate as to what the student needs, you go above and beyond, you do all of the things that you would have been hired to do related to teaching. But if you were to abuse a student, you were to do something wrong, some kind of misconduct, you were not hired to do that. So that would be outside the scope of your employment. So board policy 4158 is about employee security and the reporting of injurious objects. So the school board requires all employees to take immediate action once they become aware that a person is in possession of something that could be injurious. It's labeled up on the screen for you, the three things that you're asked to do, but I wanna focus mainly on number one, which says confiscate the object and deliver it to the principal immediately. I wanna point out that you only do so when that is done safely. So if it's not safe to confiscate an object from a student, then you are to follow your school procedure, which usually is to call the office and get assistance from administration. If a student tells you that another student may have an injurious object in their backpack, you do not wanna open the backpack and stick your hand in, in front of an entire class of students or in front of even a small group of students. Number one, it could be dangerous to do so. There could be an unlocked weapon inside there could be a needle or something that could injure you, or there could just be something gross inside that you wouldn't want to stick your hand in. You also don't want to scare children. So if you stuck your hand into a backpack and pulled out a weapon, I believe the rest of the class would be rather scared because you would be holding a dangerous weapon. So you want to call the office, have the principal come and pick up the entire backpack, take it to the office, and then the principal and school police or city police will decide what they need to do with the backpack and the object. You do, however, want to notify the principal immediately if you are to take a weapon away from a student or something that isn't really a weapon but could be used as such. And you also want to make sure that the district police and authority is notified uh, if you do remove a weapon from a 
student. Usually the principal will handle that part of the process. So board policy 4219.2, Employment Responsibilities, applies to classified personnel. This particular board policy talks about the importance of everyone doing their job and doing it well, especially as it relates to the safety and health of students. It talks about the condition of our buildings, grounds, and equipment, and it also states that everyone working in the educational environment, and especially those working closely with students, should conduct themselves in a manner that will serve as a good example to those students. Most lawsuits are either negligent supervision or negligent hiring. So did you know that you can be personally liable in a lawsuit in which you did not act reasonably or protect students from harm? Most employees go their entire career without being named in a lawsuit, but it only takes one incident in which a student is harmed or injured. So it's important to be hypervigilant and keep your eyes on students at all times. A negligent hiring claim can stem from not doing a proper background check or if someone has information regarding an applicant which may have bearing on their hiring but does not inform HR. The district and the individual who did not speak up can be liable. Negligent hiring is usually not something that regular employees that do not work in HR or do not have the responsibility for background checks would be responsible for, but you can be responsible if you have information regarding someone who might be hired by the district and it's information that is uh, negative and you do not share it. We hire the employee and then something later happens. So one of the lawsuits that came out of our district involved high school students who were unsupervised in the locker room. They sexually molested some of their teammates. The teacher, who was also the coach, lost his job and his credential is still in jeopardy. So which one is that lawsuit? Is it negligent hiring or was it negligent supervision? So the answer is negligent supervision. If the coach or teacher wasn't watching the students appropriately in the locker room, then he would be liable for negligent supervision. Here's a new scenario for you. While doing a background check, an administrator finds out information about an employee being repeatedly accused of inappropriate conduct with students. The administrator decides they do not believe the source and withholds the information from HR. Is this negligent hiring? So it is negligent hiring, but it wasn't HR that was at fault, and the administrator who did not provide the information can be held liable. They also were acting outside the scope of their job, so they may not be covered by the district's legal team or for liability purposes, their legal bills may not be paid by the district. So do you have to speak up if you have ne negative information regarding an applicant? Absolutely. Under the doctrine of vicarious liability, employers can be held strictly liable for the negligent acts or omissions of their employees. So basically what it means is if someone who's an agent of the district, which would be anyone who's of a supervisory or administrative nature, who knew or should have known of an applicant's propensities or bad conduct and failed to notify the appropriate authority, which in the previous case would have been HR, then they can be held liable. The reason is that all employees have a duty to protect students. When you withhold information that ultimately results in student injury, you and the district will be held liable. So negligence is basically about the duty of care owed by school personnel to students. And it's a duty to use reasonable measures to protect students from foreseeable injury at the hands of third parties acting negligently or intentionally. So there's an education code 48900 that has to do with hazing. So it talks about for purposes of this, it's an initiation or a pre-initiation into either a student organization or body. But we also wanna talk about when students just get together in small groups and do things that are equal to hazing. So who participates in hazing? It goes anywhere from gangs use initiation in hazing, athletic teams sometimes do, but also young children on the playground. How many times have you seen even 
as young as kindergarten age students say, okay, Johnny, we'll let you play with us if you go and pull Susie's hair. Although that sounds very like a small type of hazing or something that young children just do as part of their play and, and pulling around, we have to nip hazing in the bud when it begins at that young age so that students grow up throughout their years in school and realize that hazing is just wrong. There's a penal code, which means it's not legal to engage in hazing. It's 245.6. For your information and definition, you can check the penal code for further information. Go. So it is unlawful to engage in hazing. And any person to whom the hazing is directed can actually sue in a civil action for injury and damages. The hazing, in, lawsuit may come against an individual, but it also may be against the school district depending on the situation in which the hazing occurred, where it occurred, who was supervising or should have been supervising, and the time in which that took place. Go. Active supervision is characterized by four main strategies. It's not enough just to supervise, but you have to actively supervise. We should always teach the expected behaviors and routines for specific non-classroom settings. I know you already do it in the classroom, but think about all the things that you do outside the classroom. You should teach students how you want them to get from point A to point B. Let's say you're going to the cafeteria, you're going to the auditorium, or any other place on the campus. However you want them to get from point A to point B, you actually need to teach that. You should pre-correct, remind, and prompt students about the expected behavior and the routine that you want them before entering this non-classroom setting. You actively supervise by continuing to move, scan the area, and interact with as many students as possible. You should provide specific acknowledgments and appropriate positive reinforcement when they display that correct and expected behavior with routines and conduct. So what is active supervision? Moder monitoring procedures and using three components. Moving, scanning, and interacting frequently. So moving effectively. It should be constant. You should make your presence known and obvious. You use proximity to stop unwanted student behavior. If students are non-compliant, you move even a little closer to them. You should make moving random and you should target problem areas. What are the problem areas in your classroom, on your playground, or in your school? You should take the time as a group or staff to identify these areas and come up with how you're going to supervise them. So what is scanning effectively? Make sure that you observe all students on a regular basis. You make eye contact with students in more distant locations of the room, and you look and listen for signs of a problem. Interacting frequently has to do with having positive contact with students. You can review this list to see how many of these things that you actually do. Just know that the research shows that the more positive interactions students have with adults, the less likely they are to misbehave or feel isolated and alone, the less likely they are to be um, contemplating suicide, or any of the other things that we would not want students to be doing. So just remember that all your interactions can be positive, even when you are delivering consequences to students. Make sure that you just do it in the most respectful manner possible. And always remember to tell students that whatever their consequence was today, that tomorrow they get to start over fresh. <coughs> Where is supervision most important? Besides the classroom, hallways, restrooms, locker rooms, the bus, cafeteria and lunch rooms, on the playground, you need to decide for your particular site where supervision is most important, where those areas are where maybe there isn't as much supervision, and make sure that you have eyes on students at all times. <coughs> Going back to interaction with students, there's a relationship between the number of supervisor to student interactions and the instances of problem behavior. Make sure that your supervision is always active. 
Make sure that you have a positive impact on students. You can reduce the number of incidents of minor behavior problems by being an active and effective supervisor. So some reminders. Establish areas that are actually out of bounds for students. It's okay to say that certain areas of the campus, students are not, not allowed to go over to them. Also, do not allow students to go to areas where there is no supervision. Do not let students have access where there isn't appropriate adults and you always must maintain active and effective supervision. Eliminate the opportunities for students to access those areas, whether it is making rules for the school, for your classroom, or just letting students know by cordoning off certain areas they have to know which areas are out of bounds and that they are not allowed to be there. If you do find students in those areas, then they need to be given a consequence. Also report any student behavior you think is suspicious to administration or the office immediately. Do not wait for the end of the day to talk about something that occurred during recess or lunch. So. If after this presentation you remember only three things, the most important three things would be during your supervision in order to be active and effective, you must move, scan, and interact frequently with students. Just know that the failure to provide active and effective supervision is cause for disciplinary action. These are some of the verdicts from some of the lawsuits that were involved with negligent supervision. Take a few moments to read over them. Remember, keep your hands off the students. There are only three situations where you can place your hands on students. The first one is to prevent a student from harming another student. The second one, to prevent a student from harming him or herself. And the third time is to protect yourself. Just know that you have to make sure that you can prove that you put your hands on students for one of these three reasons. And remember, never be alone in a room with a single student. So thank you for your attention today during this presentation. And just remember that active and effective supervision not only protects the students, but it protects you as well.